Mario is in the thing, but uh, we do have someone to introduce him, and that's Greg Ibendahl, who came from Mississippi State a few years ago and is now at Kansas State University uh, working a lot with the Kansas Farm Management Association data and doing some things with that as well as research and teaching. So with that, Greg, you're up. Thanks, Rich. As Rich mentioned, uh, Keith and I were both on faculty at Mississippi State for nine years until I decided to come back to the cold weather again. I still think of Mississippi State a lot when it comes to winter time and winds blowing 30 miles an hour. Kind of wish I was back there then <laughs> at those points in time. But Keith's a great guy. We have kind of similar backgrounds too because I don't think Keith went to school to become an ag economist. He actually graduated from the University of Missouri with an ag education degree and was a VOAG teacher for five years. I don't know if he wised up or had better ideas to do something else, but he went back to A&M and got his PhD in ag, ag economics at that point. Uh, he has, has worked for the USDA ERS for several years in Washington, D.C., and then he came on the faculty at Mississippi State, and he's been there ever since. Uh, Keith's a great guy. He always loves to volunteer for plenty of things. He's been on the school board at uh, Starkville. He's been the school board president. He has served on the AAEA board. Uh, his class is always really popular, and I think the most interesting thing he's done, he has been the chief economist for one year during the Farm Bill thing last year. So I don't know if you should blame Keith for the Farm Bill being as complicated as it is, or maybe thinking that it's not more complicated than what it could have been, actually. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, Keith's been great for doing that kind of thing. I'm sure he'll have a very interesting talk today. Let's welcome Keith Coble. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've told a few of you, uh, Greg said I got my PhD at Texas A&M. Uh, I got data from the Farm Business Management As Association uh, for my dissertation. I appreciate Jeff Williams uh, collaborating with me uh, when I did that. Uh, and I remember coming up here as a grad student I think I stayed in the same hotel that I'm in this week uh, and walking over to the department and working to collect that data and, and ultimately uh, was kind of the beginning of my research career and I appreciate that. I want to echo the sentiment, you've got a great department here at Kansas State, a lot of great people. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I've learned a lot myself the last couple of days and I appreciate uh, being a part of this program. Um, Today I'm going to try to give you a little bit of overview and, and kind of relate uh, drought and disaster and those kind of issues with, with farm policy. And as Greg mentioned, uh, I got uh, volunteered to be a part of that process. Um, my wife got a lot of Delta Sky Miles to travel on out of the deal uh, as I flew back and forth to Washington. So let's begin today. And when I, when I thought about drought, what I wanted to do is put you show you the picture that hangs over my desk at, back at work. Several years ago I discovered that this famous picture that's in a lot of history books about the Dust Bowl, where actually the family's name was Coble. Uh, my father argued that they were relatives of mine, but I'm not a genealogist and I can't prove that. But anyway, one of the interesting things is several years later they interviewed one of the two little boys in that picture. His name was Daryl Coble. And they said, why didn't you leave and go to California from Cimarron County, Oklahoma? And he said, well, as far as I know, Dad was just hard-headed. And my wife and my mother both argue that that is an abiding characteristic of all men whose last name is Coble. Uh, but anyway, uh, so when we think about drought, that, that's, uh, that is... Uh, uh, and I actually, in my ag policy class, I have a lecture where we just talk about the Dust Bowl and, and all of the farm policy and all of the other policy issues associated with that event, both prior to and afterwards. I also thought about drought. I uh, recently uh, ran across this paper I thought you'd like to know. The most irrigated crop in the United States, according to this paper, is our lawns. Okay. I did have kind of a, an interesting experience. Uh, my aunt, who is 93 years old, lives in the Central Valley of California. Uh, I went out to visit her the other day in Turlock. I thought I would see the ravages of the drought and, and, and almond trees being dug up. Uh, I saw a lot of corn for a, a, a renewable fuel plant uh, being grown there in the Central Valley. Anyway, let's, 
What are we going to talk about today? What I want to do is go backwards a little bit and talk about the past of our foreign policy in the United States. I want to assess the present in terms of where do we stand now that the 2014 Farm Bill was enacted. And then I am kind of tired of talking about how the Farm Bill came about and want to talk a little bit about the next one and where are we headed from here in terms of farm policy. So we'll talk about that. Uh, I referred to the next farm bill as the last farm bill. My colleague Barry Barnett was asked to give a presentation recently, and he, he said that with a question mark, will it be the last one? Uh, I think there are people that think that it could be, and we'll talk about that today. Okay, when talking about the past and the factors leading up to the 2014 bill, first of all, it drug out for a long, long time. You know, it really started in 2011, the process, the super committee process, which ultimately I think kind of proved in hindsight to be a mistake to try to do that exercise. But we go through extensions, all these things. I got involved in the process early in 2013. I told my wife, we'll be done by Christmas, we'll be done by Christmas, I'll be home. We weren't, of course, it slewed over into January of 2014, but the bill finally got done. It, in many ways, is complicated. In many ways, it is uh, the choices that you had to make. Uh, I, I talked to Michael and Art about all the education that had to go on out here. I jokingly referred to this as the Full Employment Act for Agricultural Economists uh, several months ago. Um, it got retweeted by a, a reporter, and then my cell phone like to blew up, so I, uh, I've not got my cell phone in case there's any press today. Let's talk about the context. You cannot talk about foreign policy decisions in the United States without recognizing that this was the budget situation that we were confronted with. When I went up there and started working, I was told, look, we've got to hit a $23 billion savings on this bill. The CBO score must show $23 billion if you include sequestration, which had already happened. And it came in, as I'll show you in a moment, just barely over. CBO might have put their fingers on the scale just a little bit to get rid of us. But nonetheless, budget deficits are pervasive, that was the conversation. Things are a little better in D.C. now, but that's still going to be the context going forward. The other thing, and I know this diagram is too small for you to really see, but if you were in the upper left-hand corner, really this is, this is a study that I found recently, and the overlapping of the distributions reflect, where they overlap, it reflects Republicans and Democrats voting the same way. And it goes back into the 1940s, and you see how much overlap there were in the upper left-hand corner, and you see down here in the lower right-hand corner how little overlap there is. I once worked in Washington. I've known Hill staffers for a long time. The world has changed. It is much more partisan, in particular in the House of Representatives. I thought it was a tough go in the Senate to enact a piece of legislation. But when we started feeling sorry for ourselves, we would look over to the other side of the hill, and those poor people were trying to hold a lot of different pieces together, as, as we know. And we'll talk more about that later on. But the partisanship, and one of the papers that I read uh, while I was in Washington, actually, that there's really only about 50 seats in the House of Representatives that are in play between the two parties, OK? 50 out of the total there, not very many. And so members of Congress are constantly running to the extreme because that's where their competition is going to come in the primary rather than in the general election. Now, I, I think I'm accurate. I didn't go back and check, but the old policy textbook by Knudsen, Penn, and Flinchball had this diagram, and I think it said it this way. This is kind of the way farm policy was back Decades ago, this is, you had a group of people in the farm groups, in the legislative branch, in the administration, and there were names that just kind of circulated around, okay? They would work for a farm group and a lobby organization. They'd work on the Hill. They'd work in the administration. And, and, and the Aggies 
did their own thing, wrote their own legislation, and then to get a bill passed, there was this partnership with the group that I will call the traditional foodies. Okay? I don't mean to be disparaging of anybody by any of these names, but to give you a sense, the traditional group, those that care about SNAP benefits, school lunch programs, WIC, ultimately have had an alliance with the Aggies for decades, and that's how legislation has gotten passed for decades. Now, to update what I think the diagram is today, here you go. You have the traditional groups, but the farm groups are splintered. They're not all on the same page. They're not helping each other out very much, and they weren't in this process. There are some reasons for that, and I'll explain a little bit more. The legislative branch is more partisan. I've already shown you that. And then you've got the traditional foodies, what I will call the new foodies. You've got the Tea Party heritage faction back in the Back when I worked in Washington, we called them the budget hawks. And we have, and this is probably the one thing that I really learned while I was in D.C., that among the environmental groups, and there are many of them, you can divide them into at least two camps, what I will call the environmental dealers and the no dealers. And I'll tell you what that means. Okay. So as we went through this farm bill process, what we had were various, the commodity groups went a lot of different directions. So you had the groups that were, that were advocating for revenue protection, corn and soybeans being the major ones that, that pushed for the shallow loss ARC program. You had the traditionalists, mostly from the South, peanuts, rice, some wheat producers from the southern part of the United States. You had what I will call the bold movers, the cotton industry, really did something radically different. And why did they do something radically different? It was because they had a WTO problem. And so they went away from the Title I programs very strongly towards insurance. I grew up on a dairy farm in southern Missouri, so I have a close affinity for dairy farmers. Nothing will make you want to go to college more than putting together milking equipment at 5 a.m. on a cold winter day. Uh, the dairy program we ended up is pseudo insurance. It looks like margin insurance, but, but as a guy who's worked on rating all my career, the uh, legislated price for the milk program uh, 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 kind of I struggle with. We also had the mountain states who have big counties, I understand who did not want the ARC program. They wanted individual triggered ARC. I spent a, a, a great deal of my time while I was in Washington working on individual ARC, uh, one of my least favorite parts of the Farm Bill. But nonetheless, um, and, and I see the participation in the program, and I'm like, well, that was a lot of wasted effort. Uh, of course, the sugar industry, who, when there's a Farm Bill debate, a program that does not have a budget score, and that's what our sugar programs have, you know, because they're quotas and so forth. Ultimately, are, they just want to not be seen, okay? Let's, let's go stand over in the corner and let's let everybody pr pretend we don't exist. Now, the non-commodity teams, and I referred to the environmental dealers and no dealers, basically in this past farm bill, what we had were some environmental groups who were willing to sit down at the table with farm groups. They negotiated a compromise that led to conservation compliance on crop insurance. Now, the environmental no dealers are the other group that just throw bombs in the room, okay? They lob bombs towards farm programs, okay? The environmental dealers are willing to talk with farm groups. The other side is not. So there's at least two subgroups among the environmental movement. I think you need to understand that to understand what's going on, okay? The Tea Party Heritage Faction, they want to reduce Title I. They want to reduce Title XI. They want to reduce SNAP benefits. They want to reduce spending. Okay, they want to see the SNAP program, Title IV, split away from the farm programs. That's what they did, and they were effective for a time in the House. And ultimately, what do they want? They want to throw a bomb in the room 
And it's very interesting that sometimes you, that you will see environmental no-dealers and, and the Tea Party faction together, okay? In, politics makes strange bedfellows, okay? Lots of them. That's one example. And, of course, you've got the traditional food groups the, the, that, that really want to assist the poor. And I sometimes get chastised for what I'm going to say next, but, but ultimately... When you see the local food movement, the GMO movement, the specialty crop movement, the animal welfare people, their focus are on more upscale individuals. Okay? It's not really about the poor. Now they, they try to maintain an alliance, but these are two fundamentally different constituent groups. Okay? But they're all talking about nutrition programs. So that's the context. That's what led to the bill that you got. Okay? Now, here's the chart that I made when it's all said and done. By title, the different categories. If the bar is red, that means the program, that title got cut. If the bar is green, uh, there was more money placed in there. What you see is that the commodity title took the biggest hit of all. Most of sequestration came out of that title as well. Uh, mo most of those savings are the elimination of the direct payment program. Okay. Conservation programs were cut mostly to, because people were pulling land out of the CRP program, so we latched on to those savings because we had to hit $23 billion savings. The nutrition title took an $8 billion cut, which was a very small percentage of the total program and probably will ultimately end up being not that. The, the cost of the nutrition program is coming down quite rapidly, but it's because of an improving economy, not because of this legislation. And you see crop insurance spending went up. Uh, we'll talk more about that later on, 5.7 billion increase. This is a 10-year score, by the way, uh, at the time the bill was passed. An awful lot of that was to one commodity, cotton. The increase in the crop insurance program was largely moving the cost of the stacks program there. Given the participation numbers we're seeing in stacks, that score was too high. Stacks is not going to cost what we thought it was going to cost when we wrote that bill. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about where we've been with crop insurance. I really kind of put the modern era of crop insurance in 1980. Art might put it at a different point, but nonetheless, we saw significant legislation in the mid-1990s, the ARPA Act of 2000, and then we have some legislation uh, in the bill. You know, th think about it, for many, many, many years, crop insurance was never included in the farm bill. Now it is at the core of farm support in the farm bill. That is a change that has occurred in the past 20 years. In fact, it's a change that has occurred since 2000 when we passed the ARPA Act. It has become the heart of farm support rather than at the periphery. Okay? I think one of the things that we, ha when we, when we have this conversation, one of the things I'll remind you, because when I worked at USDA, one of the things I worked on quite a bit while I was there was the ad hoc disaster programs. And many of the, those of you that are older remember the ad hoc disaster programs that we had in the 80s and the 90s and so forth. And we were in this kind of political no man's land of we were subsidizing crop insurance and participation wasn't very high, and we were still doing ad hoc disaster payments year after year after year. Okay? Over time, we have reduced the likelihood of ad hoc disaster payments. I particularly noted this when Senator Lincoln of Arkansas tried very, very hard to get a disaster program in 2010. It was essential to her reelection, she thought, and it didn't happen. The USDA did something, but not much of a program, and she certainly not, never got her legislation across the board. Think also of how severe the drought of 2012 was in major agricultural states, and how much talk did you hear about doing a disaster bill? Not much. Okay, We've ch now, was it cheap to end that discussion? No, we'll talk more about that later on. 
If we look, here's a plot going back to the 1980s of the subsidy percentage and the net acres insured. And so the subsidy percentage there you see jumped up in the mid-1990s, and on a percentage basis it's zigzagged a little bit, it's climbed a little bit, and then the green line re represents acres. So over time, we've jacked the subsidy of the crop insurance program up. We have brought acres into the program, the big jump occurring in 1995, and then it's climbed since then. Well, we also have increased the liability, the dollar amount that is there. Now, I have adjusted these dollar amounts to 2014 data. So I have taken the, the rise and now decline of crop values out of this. This is 2014 dollars. The green bar represents the net liability of the program and the yellow line represents uh, acres. What we have done is that we got acres into the program and then over time we have gotten farmers to buy higher and higher coverages for, through various mechanisms. That's where we're at today, okay? The other thing that when we look at this, we look at the premium subsidy, how it is climbed over time. As I'll point out in a moment, the premium subsidy is a function of the value of the crop. Therefore, high prices create more subsidy, lower prices create less subsidy, all else equal. The A&O reimbursement, is, which is a separate calculation, goes to the companies for delivery. And then we see the underwriting gains and losses through time. And these are things that Art Barnaby have talked about for years. But we see where we have been. And when the yellow line is below zero, that means there were underwriting gains. And you see the 2012 event pop up there. And these are aggregate national level numbers. So the experiences in, in Kansas may be quite different. Here's a figure that I've, that I've updated recently, but it still is fascinating to me. When we look at the program between 1980 and 1995, this is a program that in most years, the loss ratio was above one. Legislatively, it was required to be at one, and it was not happening. Okay, even in good weather years, the program was paying out more than it was supposed to. If you remember 1995, 1996, when we brought people into the program, I consider that very much a defining moment and a break point in the history of this program. Since then, we look at the loss ratios. It's bounced around, but on average, it has been 0.88, okay? Which with a load is just dead on with where they're trying to be. Okay, so this increased participation has changed the program in a lot of ways. Now, why does the more recent experience look the way it looks? I think there are several things. One is there have been, and based on the presentation yesterday, we've gone through a period of good weather. We certainly brought in more participants, and I think many would argue less risky participants. I think that's part of it. We've got better production practices, better genetics, a lot of things, and we probably have better rates on the program, okay? Now, how much do you attribute to any one of those things or some other factor? I don't think we're able to sort that out, or at least nobody has yet. It's difficult to tease those things apart, but it is rather fascinating that the program has become more actuarially sound. Now, I'm gonna argue not actuarially sound enough, but it has gotten better. So let's talk about where we're at today. We'll talk about the Title I programs first. The sign up in, farm pro, in the pro, farm programs, and I would say, I, I asked some of you uh, on the faculty uh, in the last 24 hours about the, the, the sign up. I thought wheat was the most interesting case where it was more of a choice in some respects for farmers, and depends on what part of the country that you're in. But, we went out and we had a lot of explaining to do with farmers, and I know here in Kansas there were uh, all kinds of programs done to explain to you this process, but I will give our profession a little bit of credit. I don't think these sign-ups are terribly surprising. 
And I, they're not surprising to the people who wrote the legislation because here's the bottom line. The commodity groups were told you're going to take a 13 30, excuse me, a 30 percent reduction in your baseline, but we're going to let you have what you want in terms of program. Now, they didn't, it didn't work out exactly that way, but fundamentally that's what they were, they were said. All right, whatever your baseline by your commodity is, reduce it by 30 percent and then tell us what you want. Okay? That had already happened before I went up there. And so we get these various programs, and so you see corn and soybeans wanted ARC. What did they participate in? Rice and peanuts wanted PLC. What did they participate in? Wheat is the most evenly divided of all the commodities, which does not surprise me. So a lot of these outcomes, even though it took you a while to wrap your brain around all of those choices you had to make, it looks to me like people, partly based on good advice and mostly based on common sense, figured out what was in their own best interest. Okay? And so these participation, and, and I do think that CBO, which part of the, my time up there, part of what I had to work on, is that CBO had decided that people were going to like individual ARC. And we spent a ton of time driving CBO score out of individual ARC. And ultimately, not too many people took it. Okay? Now, one of the things that you need to understand in, ser in terms of when you do farm policy in Washington, the, things, the cost of things matter. Okay? Whether your proposed legislation is going to cost more or less than existing legislation matters. So what do we have? Well, we have a completely different world now. As we have shifted money out of Title I to Title XI towards crop insurance. In our Title I programs in the past, and even the programs that we have now, lower prices resulted in higher outlays from the government. That is not true with crop insurance, the NC, but when we generally reduce the level of prices, which has gone on in the last couple of years, what happens? The amount of subsidy that is computed by the CBO goes down. And so as price levels have come down, the crop insurance score has come down. Okay? So, we're in a different ball game than we were with the old price triggered Title I programs. Where are we at today? Revenue protection, an idea that our Barnaby thought of many years ago, dominates the crop insurance industry. We have revenue insurance with the harvest price protection is swamping everything else. One of the fascinating things to me is that a lot of us in the ag economics profession have been intrigued by area concepts for years. Farmers have never taken up area triggered programs very much. Yet when you really look what we did a lot of that's new in this farm bill, it is the ARC program that's triggered on county yields and we added the SCO program and we added stacks. All county triggered. I think the great experiment of this farm bill will be whether farmers really buy in to county triggered programs. I'll talk more about that later on. We've got a lot of variation around the country. Here's a couple of maps for you. Corn on the left, wheat on the right. These are 2014 average coverage levels. The, mid, the heart of the corn belt is at a very high coverage level, uh, averaging around 80% coverage level on corn. You can see that you're much lower here in Kansas in general. Uh, you can see wheat as well. And Art and I were talking about that last night, that this is largely a function of this being a riskier region. Okay? And I think that that probably is true. Enterprise units are a big deal. And one of the things when I talk to farmers, one of the things I, I say to them all the time, if you have not asked your crop insurance agent about enterprise units, you should. Okay? And I think you'll see why in a few slides. But this is one of the things that, that has come on. And I believe now 
that more than half of the corn and soybeans in the United States are in enterprise units. The number is, is over half now. Okay? Since we're talking about drought and disaster, one of the things that, that is less known about the crop insurance program now, is, and it has to do with your rates, that is very much related to the weather, is an effort that, has, that RMA has undergone to try to take into account the proper probability you put on these catastrophic events. Losses are largely driven by the extreme events in the crop insurance program, okay? The fundamental question that's been around forever is that, okay, was 2012 in the Corn Belt, was it a one in 10 event? Was it a one in 20? Was it a one in 50? Well, from a rating standpoint, it matters a lot whether it was one in 20 or one in 50, okay? So the relationship between weather and yields is, is really important. It is not regionally stable. It's not the same across different crops. So given we observe a particular loss experience in a county or in a crop in, a, in 2005, what probability do we put on it? Historically, what RMA do, did is keep around all this loss data and give equal weight to every historical gear. Okay? But there's a problem with that. And that really has to do with the fact that we don't always think that every year has the same amount of weight. And how many years do we need? Because if you keep 30, 40 years of this loss experience, there's a problem. The loss experience from, from 1992, it was a different program. The data was handled differently. The guarantees were constructed differently. The, there are so many things that have changed that keeping the older data around is problematic, but you need lots of weather. And you need lots of years to capture weather. The resolution is that RMA has adopted a system that now uses a base rating period of 20 years, but it weather weights the loss experience in a climate division based on a longer time series, and it also adjusts the pre-1995 experience. Now this has been around two or three years and it's actually about to work its way out of its system, but, but that's based on those earlier slide that I showed you that said basically before 1995 it was a different program. So here are the climate divisions. If you're familiar with the crop reporting districts in Kansas, they're pretty similar, uh, maybe exact in some instances, but these are the, the areas where this is done. They use NOAA weather data back to 1895 to build an index so that you can say, well, okay, what was 2005 relative to the historic average, okay? And so you have information about drought, participation, temperature, heat units, and so forth. And here's an example out of Iowa. This is the weather index back to 1895. You can see the 1930s in there. You can see the 1950s and the various catastrophic events that we've had. So this is used to answer the question of what is the probability relative to the experience that we've had back to 1895. But it doesn't create artificial losses that go into the crop insurance program. So let me turn now to the future. Where are we headed with farm policy? And to to think about the future, I'm going to pose five questions to you today, okay? So we're, we're done with the 2014 sign up. We can take a deep breath and already groups are talking about what's the next farm bill going to look like. So I've got five questions for you to think about with respect to the future of farm policy. Number one, What's the future of ARC, PLC, and LDP? So I want to separately talk about the Title I programs. We went two different directions, the traditional program and the ARC program. Talk about that a little bit, okay? And question number two, I really enjoyed hearing the presentations about Precision Ag and what Terry had to say and, and, and so forth. I, the Precision Ag movement fascinates me because I think it has the potential in some respects to be a game changer in terms of data, in terms of our ability, and we'll talk more about that later on. But there's a whole lot of issues associated with it. The privacy issue, 
the knowledge and being able to put these data together in an effective manner and not just kind of wave our hands. Okay. What's next for crop insurance is the third question. What are we going to do with crop insurance now that it has become the premier support for production agriculture? We'll talk about that. I want to speculate a little bit what the next farm bill will look like. And then finally, I want to broaden back out once again and end up by talking about what will ag risk management look like in a few years. So, number one. I think the answer to the question about what we're going to do with ARC and PLC and so forth depends in part with the satisfaction the farmers find from a county yield trigger program. I said that I, if, if this winter you hear people complaining that SCO had a different county yield than ARC and that was a different number than NAS reported for a county. You can say you heard it from me first. I think we're going to have some instances where USDA is going to produce three different yield estimates for a county. And I defy USDA to explain to you as a producer why there are three different yields for your county. I think there is a logical reason why but you're not going to be satisfied with that logical reason, okay? Why did that happen? And the other question that's going to come about is that county-triggered program going to trigger when you have a yield loss, okay? Historically, farmers have not been enamored with county trigger. It's going to be interesting to see. Um, the yield, that's the yield basis risk question. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. I think county triggers are going to work well for a lot of people, but it's not going to work well for everybody. The other point that I want to make, and, and for this conference, I sat down and did a calculation that I'd been wanting to do for a while. The baseline for ARC is going to erode before the next bill, in all likelihood. And I, I want to show you why. This is from Mississippi, but it doesn't matter, because prices are what really are driving the results. This is a simulation we did for ARC in Mississippi on soybeans. We were predicting very low 2014 payments. 2015 looked pretty good. Why? Because the Olympic average was still picking up some high soybean prices when lower soybean prices were occurring in 2015. And then we see our expectations for ARC payments in the out years. This is roughly what I would say today what we're looking in those out years. Because the Olympic average is going to ratchet down, the expectations are going to go down. Okay? Now, what does that result in? What I did is a little calculation. I took the CBO baseline and I extended, I took the last year and extended it three years into the future. So I'm trying to get a ballpark estimate of what the CBO scores are going to look like when we're talking about a farm, when this farm bill is expiring. And my best guess today is this, that the CBO baseline for feed grains is going to go down by 26%. The baseline for beans are going to go down by 28%. And for wheat, it's going to go down 13%. Just because prices in the Olympic average are going to slide down this decline that we've had. Okay? Which means there's not going to be as much money there to divvy out when we start talking about the next farm bill. What does that mean? It means that even more likely than today, the money in the farm program is going to be in the crop insurance program. Okay, let's talk about the big data and crop insurance. The chief actuary of RMA has said on a number of occasions, I think he's right, the next step in rating is to tie experience to land. It's not really tied to land right now, okay? It will be a game changer in terms of a data management system. I've explained, and, and I'm no expert on geo-reference data, but I know this much. It's a different data system than what has been around in the past. They've done some pilots already on this, but if we go to geo-reference so that when you pick up a piece of land, the yield history, the yield experience on that piece of land would come to you. You can then adjust rates to reflect soil type. 
I'm, I'm, I will tell you a little story. I moved to Mississippi. I went to the Delta. I drove across the Delta many times, and I could not figure out why these farmers kept telling me, I don't buy crop insurance because my neighbor is a crop insurance cheat. I know he's cheating the program. And finally, several years after I moved there, I said, how do you know that your neighbor is cheating the program? Because he's planting cotton on soil that I know should not grow cotton. He built his yield guarantee up on good soil, cotton ground, and this year he planted on non-cotton ground. Because the delta will fool you. Because it's an alluvial plain and it's got a sandbar over here and sticky clay over here and the soil types are all over the place. And who knows those soil types? The neighbors. Okay. This could be a big difference in areas where we have a lot of heterogeneity in soil types and such. Okay. In terms of crop insurance, I think crop insurance will have the big red bullseye on it in terms of people wanting to find money. Okay. Art alluded to this yesterday. It, I don't know how crop insurance does not have a target. I think the other thing that is really fascinating is that a lot of people have now looked at crop insurance as the carrot to get people to do environmental activities. There are some really interesting dynamics there. I don't know how that's always going to work, but we're going to be having a lot of conversation about crop insurance and its relationship to the environment, cover crops and things like that, conservation programs, because it is perceived as the last big carrot that's outside of the conservation type. Okay? Take a good look at this chart. These are the subsidy percentages for the crop insurance program. You have coverage levels in the first column, basic and optional subsidy percentages in the second column, enterprise units in the third, SCO subsidies in the final column. Those percentages are as high as they're ever going to be. That's my prediction. They will not get higher. They're only, there's only one way for them to go from here on out, and that's down. The political envi environment is such that that's where we're at. Whether they cap for large farms, whether they take it off of the harvest price option, or they play with this chart, but they will, the, the political battles will be such that the discussion is going to be where do these come down and how? Um, there's going to be a lot of effort to try to stop that, but that's going to be the debate in the future. Understand this about subsidy, and again, I'm echoing something that Art said yesterday, but subsidy is a function of the difference between the RMA expected premium and the producer paid premium. It is a subsidy is going to increase. All else equal, famous, all economists love to say that. There is more subsidy if you have a higher value crop. There is more subsidy if you are a riskier crop. There's more subsidy if you insure more acres, if you choose a higher coverage level in general. Enterprise units and revenue protection is gr subsidy is greater than the revenue protection with the harvest price exclusion, which is greater than for yield protection in general. I think I can find a few exceptions to some of what I'm saying, but in general, this is true. This means that if you're a riskier practice than your neighbor, all else equal, you get more subsidy. Okay? Over time, this is what we've come up with. Uh, I've had several conversations with Hill staffers over many years about, is, is this the best subsidy system? I don't know anybody that says yes, but every time you come up with an alternative, somebody will say, oh, we can't go there. Okay? This is where we're at. We're going to be having conversations about this in the future. Okay? Let's talk about subsidy a little bit. There's a lot of discussion about it. There's billions of dollars per year on the table here. This is because I like to work on the actuarial stuff. And 
my colleague Barry Barnett and I did a paper a few years ago about why do we subsidize crop insurance. Well, other than just trying to give money out the door, I think we have to understand that subsidy masks errors in rating. Okay? A few years ago, I got the opportunity to work with the former president of the Casualty and Actuarial Society of America, Mary Frances Miller, a delightful lady, funny, really, really smart, and she had never looked at crop insurance, and she came to look at it, and here's what she said. My God, this is hard to do. This is worse than hurricane insurance. Okay? That was her reaction to crop insurance. It's, she said... Hurricane insurance has the same kind of catastrophic rare events, except for the fact that if I know whether your house has a particular kind of structure, a brick exterior versus a siding exterior, at a certain level elevation, I can pretty much get your rates right. She's like, but you're, every crop is different. Every soil is different. This is the most complicated thing I've ever looked at, she said. Okay? This is not easy. So what have we done? We have masked all the errors in rating uh, with subsidy. I think there is going to be an interesting dialogue about whether um, if we can get the rates better, does the subsidy need to mask there? But the problem with the subsidy is that if I'm high risk, you're low risk, and we can't tell each other apart, then we both get the same subsidy. Okay. I think, and Art touched upon this yesterday, I think we could potentially have our very best farmers wanting to back out of the program. If the subsidy comes down, I've had people talk to me about this, I'm not sure I agree with them, that they think they're just so much less risky than their neighbors that their rates are way too high. They still think that because of production practices, because of soil, okay? So there's going to be this tension between subsidy and rating, okay? But in general, surprisingly, ag economists are fairly much in agreement that the, elastic, the demand for crop insurance is fairly inelastic, okay? So we're going, to, and, but it's different between whether we're talking about liability or whether we're talking about acres, and those are kind of consensus estimates, but those estimates are pretty old, okay? We've not updated them lately. Okay, I changed this slide last night as I was thinking about things I heard yesterday and what I should say. What's the next farm bill going to look like? Increasingly, I don't know that our best farmers are going to care enormously what's in the commodity title if we keep cutting money out of it. That trade policy, that environmental regulations, that, whoop, don't know what I did. Did I do that? <laughs> it's probably update time. <laughs> All right. I, let me put this down. If it comes back, it comes back. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, as we try to move forward, I think that we're going to, to struggle with some of these discussions, but I think our, that, that the benefits to the crop insurance program, the benefits of the commodity title programs aren't going up, they're going down. You may really care more about the RFS, environmental regulations, than you will the commodity title that might happen in the next farm bill. I didn't think I'd say that a decade ago, but I, I think especially our best producers are going to, to, to live in this world. And those of you that are really, you know, they're growing, the, the, the gentleman that, that spoke last night, is your relationship with your landlords going to be more important than what, whether you took ARC or PLC? I think the answer is yes. So worry about what really matters to your bottom line, okay, is what I'm, what I'm trying to point out. I think in the Farm Bill debate, I, I think it will be very interesting to see whether 
the coalition of environmental no dealers and the Heritage Foundation Tea Party group reunites, and I suspect it will, and I think their number one objective, again, will be to separate SNAP benefits from USDA programs. Uh, I think there will be a lot of discussion about that. The other thing that I think probably makes sense, to a certain, and this may not be clear to you, but to a certain degree, I think we need to think about putting programs on autopilot. We have been writing Title I with parameters written in there, assuming, well, this is about right for the target price for this program for the next few years, and then we'll, we'll fix it in the next farm bill. I think to a certain degree, one of the things about the ARC program that I think is rather intriguing is that it's a little bit on autopilot in terms of the moving averages. Okay? Will the target price for rice be right when we write the next farm bill? Probably not. And we talked, we had conversations about putting these things as a function of something rather than a hard number written in the legislation. And I think my point being is whether it makes sense to, to write programs that are flexible, that will self-correct rather than staffers coming up with target prices to plug in. You know, uh, just a thought. I think another question that will come about is the question of will the coalition of environmental groups and farm group, the environmental dealers and farm groups strengthen or weaken? I don't know. I will say this, that in writing this last farm bill, if you said something was insurance, if it was for risk management, it was golden, okay? It was, oh, it's crop insurance. Well, crop insurance is good. I think by the time we write the next farm bill, that won't be so golden. And I think that crop insurance, is, as I said, has the big bullseye on it. It's going to be the target for, to, to go get money. It's going to be the target for a lot of other reasons. And so what is the argument that, that farm groups are going to make in the next farm bill? And I don't know right now. I don't know that the risk argument will still hold by the time we write the next one. Okay, an attempt to write one. So, with that, Rich, I think. Uh, well, I think I was almost done. <laughs> uh, let me let me just talk briefly about where I think risk management's going, because that's what's left. I think increasingly what we are seeing with all of this interaction, and and and, and those of us that have been around long enough know that there used to be a group of economists who did policy work. And there was a different group of economists who did crop insurance work. And it's a it was a third group of economists who looked at futures and options and price risk management. And we all went and talked to our own meetings and we didn't talk to each other a whole lot and cross purposes a whole lot. And sometimes we didn't even like each other very much, okay? I think where we've got to go in terms of risk management is we've got to get the finance people, we've got to get the marketing people, we've got to get the crop insurance people, and the policy people all in the same room, and let's talk about the interactions. One of the more satisfying things that I've done in my career is look at the interaction between forward pricing and crop insurance. We can also crop insurance and financial management. I think the precision ag management is going to change a lot of things as well. I think we've got to come up with holistic systems to manage risk. And we can't put your price risk and your crop insurance and your finances in these separate little worlds and pretend that they don't interact with each other because they do. But now, it's hard enough to think about one of those things at a time, and it really gets messy. And that's some of what we saw in these Farm Bill decision aids. Let me just end up by saying that... Uh, if you go on to the next slide, please. Uh, 
Are you farmers going to accept a black box risk management machine that puts all those things together? And I think that was some of the questions that we had with the Farm Bill decision aids. People didn't understand what was going on behind the scenes. Okay? And it's not simple. Okay? So who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust your input supplier? Your grain merchandiser? Who are you going to trust in terms of these, putting these pieces together? I do think that there's an opportunity to try to put something that is valid together. I would argue that, that we need to talk to you more about understanding risk so that you can under, understand the decision aids that were built and less than just talking about the program, okay? I think technological progress is going to change things in ways that none of us know right now, and I hope risk management is more integrated. Rich, I will stop there. I think my time's about up, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. We've got time for questions. Go ahead and ask. Yes, sir. Okay. Where is the government going to hide the money or how are they going to face the money from the food stamps? Because, as I understand it, the majority of the farm bill dollars are Absolutely. I think it's a... It's, uh, the, yeah, the question is, assume that we maybe get through the next farm bill, but in eight, ten years, it's impossible to pass another farm bill. The question, and it's a good one. Well, if we can't do farm legislation, can we still do food stamp legislation? I would say that in the House of Representatives today, you probably could not do SNAP by itself. That's going to be a really interesting question because those are big programs. And they do have advocates from urban areas. I'm going to say something that you're probably not going to like, but I don't think those programs have as many enemies as farm programs do today. Okay. They have, because of population, because every member of Congress has somebody who benefits from SNAP. And there are not many members of Congress who really have a significant farm population in their district. Uh, it's kind of, you know, I'd always heard it, I believed it, but when you go up there and work on the Hill and you see it with your own eyes, it kind of smacks you in the face. So. Other than those trying to reduce government spending, I don't know how many enemies those programs have. Farm programs have more. But good question. I hadn't th really thought of it that way, but that's, that's a fair question. But this coalition has been around for decades to keep both together. And I think there will continue to be efforts to try to do that. You know, I haven't paid a lot of attention when, when I got called up there to work on the farm bill, and that consumed me, and I haven't really got back to the RFS. I follow the news like everybody else. It, it looks like that's, you know, it's a tough. I, I, several years ago, I heard it, it was a, I can't remember the name of the individual, but he was a, a well-known uh, D.C. Um, talking head. Okay, and he said the corn growers have just been on a remarkable run of successes. You keep thinking they're going to lose a fight and they keep winning. Uh, and, and the renewable fuel industry. Uh, I think it's just going to be a brutal fight between the renewable fuel industry and the oil industry from here on out. Uh, I just think they're just going to just swing at each other from now on. And I guess if, and don't consider me an expert on this, I would kind of say the same thing about the RFS as I do about crop insurance subsidies. They're not going to get a lot. Unless there's some kind of a game changer. And let's face it, what's the biggest challenge to the RFS? Fracking. 
you can say political, but but when we've got we discover all this oil through fracking and things like that, it, it it's a different ball game than when the RFS was first implemented. I think there was another question somewhere. Okay? I appreciate it very much.